Good morning. It is a uh, privilege to be here with you this morning. I've been preaching for about a year and a half in Spanish. So if I just start talking a lot of language, don't even correct me, just nod your head, appreciate what I'm saying, and uh, maybe you'll even get out of here quicker. Who knows? Um, uh, we are uh, planting Iglesia Reforma in Guatemala City. Uh, Guatemala is a really unique context in terms of religion, supposedly 50% evangelical. Um, a lot of numbers have come out recently explaining that the largest percentage of that are adherents of an aberrant gospel of the prosperity theology. And uh, it's not really much theology in and of itself, but that's what we've called it. And so. Uh, we're in a, a really hard place because there's a lot of people there who talk about a guy named Jesus, but the way that we talk about him is very different than the way the Bible talks about him. And they talk about a God and they talk about a Bible, but all those things are very different than what we believe God's Word actually says. And so what ends up happening is that charlatans stand up in front of thousands of people and have deceived them into believing a message that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they use all the same words that we do. So it's a challenging environment, it's a challenging context and situation, but God's been abundantly faithful to us and uh, continues to um, teach more and more people the truth of, of the actual gospel. And so, uh, so we're thrilled to be able to participate in that. We're excited to be able to be here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 28 this morning, the very last verses in that chapter. Um, but before we jump into the verse, many of us at one point or another have wrestled with our purpose in life. I'm sure all of us at some point or another have asked ourselves, what am I really doing here? Why, why do I exist? Does God have something bigger for me? And if we're not careful, this question can become pretty self-centered. Um, we want to believe that we are something really unique and special in God's eyes for which He has created this really unique and special plan that no one else will be able to execute. And I'm not entirely certain that that's how it works. However, as life sort of marches on, we tend to consider this question quite frequently. And many of us have had phases of life where life just seems monotonous. We wake up at the same time every morning, we get dressed. We get coffee, we get in the car, and we go to work. And we spend eight, nine, ten hours at work with the same co-workers, having many of the same conversations just to get back into the same car, drive home, stop at the supermarket, stop at the gym, some of us. Some of us should consider that step in our schedule. No names, but you know who you are. <laughs> and then we get home, back to the same house, and we have the same five or six meals. Some, <laughs> somebody's not been eating very well at their house. I don't know who it is. but. <laughs> and then we lay our kids down in the same bed, and we go to bed. We wake up the next morning, and we do it all over again. 365 days a year, for 40 or 50 years, until the only thing that changes is we play golf instead of going to work. At least that's the dream, isn't it? So yeah, when we zoom out and look at life that way, it seems like all of the places that we go and all of the things that we do just sort of suck the life and time out of us. And the things that we do don't actually give us life. It seems like they take life from us. And it appears that we have no purpose. So we constantly ask ourselves this question while we're in the car, what am I doing? While we're at work, what am I doing? When we're at home, what am I doing? When we're at the store, when we're at the gym, when we're stopping for coffee, wherever it is, we are asking ourselves, what am I doing? And today we're talking about what if everyone went. And I don't think the point is that everyone needs to sell their car, sell their house, sell their dog, or other animals you might have domestically in your home, and go to live in the Amazon jungles to reach a people group with whom no contact has ever been made. That's not the point. The point is, 
What if everyone took seriously the task of inviting other people to follow Jesus? What if everyone went intentionally? What if everyone went proactively? What if everyone went and invited their neighbor, their coworker, their brother, their sister, their mom, their dad to a conversation where they explained to them why the gospel is the best news they could ever hear? What if everyone went and did that? This is precisely the vision of the Great Commission. Let's look at these verses together. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We've heard these verses a lot. There's a reason why this passage, there's a couple of reasons why this passage fascinates me. First of all, it's the context in which this passage is given. Jesus has spent three years with His disciples. Jesus has recently died and resurrected, and we find Peter and the disciples back in Galilee fishing again. That's actually the story in, in, in John's version. Peter's back doing his normal job. Now, you would think, just spitballing here, you would think that if you spent three years with the sovereign king of the universe, watched him die and rise again, you wouldn't be like, I think I'm going to go fishing. That's where Peter finds it. Ba- back in the ordinary. Back in the normal, every day coming and going is where Peter and the disciples find themselves, and they find this point where Jesus and him, apparent, Jesus and the disciples had, 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 um, had decided to go to together, and it says in verse 17 that they begin to worship and adore Him. In that context, Jesus comes, and He commissions them. One of the other reasons why I love this passage is that D- Jesus doesn't just commission them and basically say, well, good luck. I'm going to go. You guys can handle this, Right? But the commission of making disciples is like the meat in a sandwich. It's got two promises, one that comes before it and one that comes after it, that give us the context of this commission. Notice what Jesus says in verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and where? And on earth has been given to me. Jesus starts out by explaining that His authority extends to heaven and earth. When a lot of times as Christians we think about Jesus, we think, yeah, Jesus is really in charge up there somewhere. But down here, this stuff's, this stuff's pretty confusing. This stuff's pretty bad. Jesus said, I have authority over everything in heaven and on earth. He begins by explaining that there is nothing in all of creation that is not under His sovereign rule. There's no bird in the air that goes hungry. There's no flower that withers without Him knowing it. There's no storm, no trial, no difficulty that is not under Christ's authority. Just as the disciples had watched Jesus calm storms with His words, multiply bread and fish, heal the sick, the disciples recognized that all of the natural order depends on Christ and responds to Christ's authority. Ultimately, what Jesus is saying to His disciples before commissioning them to go and make disciples is that He is already King and Lord over everything, whether the world recognizes it or not. At this very instant, a lot of times we think about sort of this perennial battle between good and evil, and we assume that these are two equally potent forces. It's entirely false. Evil's been conquered. Christ has won. And Christ is on the throne. And all authority is already His. There's no threat that Jesus might lose. We're not sitting here crossing our fingers hoping the gospel might be true. Because Jesus buried sin and death and rose again. So that's why He can say, all authority is mine. Didn't you, don't you remember what I just did? All of creation is acting precisely as He commands it to act. Abraham Kuyper says, 
There's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. So I put this really practically because this is in the context of making disciples. Your neighbor, your family member, your friend, your coworker who is hostile to the Christian faith is not somehow outside of Christ's sovereign rule. ISIS is not somehow outside of Christ's sovereign rule. There is no authority greater than the authority of Jesus. And the moment then that Jesus decides to exercise his authority so that your neighbor, your friend, your co-worker follows him, do you know what they'll do? They'll follow him. They'll bend the knee, take off the crown, and recognize that he is king. Because all authority is Jesus's. And you and I go and we speak to our friends and family and we speak to our neighbors confident that Jesus has authority over them. As a matter of fact, we, we confidently preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, yes, because Jesus has authority, but also Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 that it pleases God to save through the preaching of the cross. God is pleased. God enjoys saving when we preach the message of the cross. So we boldly go forth and make disciples because Jesus has authority. Can I push back on a little bit of something that I think that we often think of? Actually, I'm going to do it anyways. I don't know why I'm asking you permission. Sorry. Jesus is not endlessly knocking on the door of people's hearts just hoping that they'll open the door for Him. That's not the way evangelism works. Our Christ is not so weak and helpless. We believe that Jesus is King, and the moment that He exercises authority, people will fall prostrate and worship Him above all things. Paul tells us in Philippians 2, every knee will bow. Not a single one that won't, and not a single tongue that won't confess. So we move forward into the spaces of our life confidently making disciples because we know that Jesus has all the authority. But that's not all he says. Look at verse 20, the other piece of bread in the sandwich, if you will. It says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Not only does Jesus have all the authority, but Jesus has sent His Spirit, and His Spirit accompanies us at all times. There's not a moment of our life where God's Spirit is not with those who are His children. I think one of the greatest causes of fear and discomfort in sharing the gospel with other people and inviting other people to follow Jesus is that it feels like a really lonely thing to do. We feel really lonely when we're communicating the gospel. We must feel like we're the only dummy on the planet that believes this stuff. That's the way it feels when we're alone sharing the gospel with someone. But the truth of the matter is that we're never alone. The truth of the matter is that the Holy Spirit accompanies us in every moment. When we go and have a conversation with our neighbor, we're not alone. We go and have a conversation with our friend, we're not alone, with our family member, with our co-worker. The authority of Jesus, as revealed in His Spirit, accompanies us at all times. So we don't have to have these conversations trusting in our own ability or power to convince the other person that what we believe is true. We don't have to make the sale. Because we believe the Holy Spirit's with us. And the same Holy Spirit who convinced me to believe in the gospel has the power to do the same in them. The, the Spirit uses our, our feeble, weak, broken, natural words to display His strength, His glory, and His supernatural work in others. That we're not necessary to God's task, but that God out of grace has involved us 
in it. Let me put it this way. When I was a kid, Dad washed the car often. We had old, beat-up cars, so they might as well be clean, I think was his philosophy. So we washed it a lot. Once a week, something like that is what it seemed like. It could have been much less, but I just didn't enjoy washing the car. So we'd go out, and Dad would invite me along, four, five, six years old, to go out and and wash the car with him. And I remember at one point, um, I wasn't a particularly astute child, but at one point, I never once had moments of brilliance. And as he was washing a part of the car, I remember looking back thinking, I just washed that part. Does he not know I just washed that part of the car? This is just an insult to my work. And finally, a little bit later, it clicked. Maybe I'm not so great at washing the car. See, Dad didn't invite me to come wash the car because I was good at washing the car. Dad that, that invites me to wash the car to be with Him, to know Him, to trust Him. The same is true with our evangelistic efforts. God doesn't invite us into making disciples because we're somehow good at making disciples. God doesn't invite us into making disciples because we're really good at evangelizing. God doesn't need me to make disciples. God doesn't need you to make disciples, but He invites us into doing this because it's better for us. That He, out of His love and out of His goodness and out of His grace, has invited us into what God is doing globally. He's invited us into God's mission. There is no greater purpose, there is no greater mission than being able to involve ourselves in His. All authority belongs to Jesus. And Jesus is always with us in His Spirit. And in the middle of these two promises, we find the Great Commission. Now, in this Great Commission, go and make disciples, there's only one imperative. There's only one imperative as a commandment, for those of you that didn't like grammar in school. Imperative as a commandment, sit down, eat that, go to bed, those things. Those are the imperatives that I have in my mind because I have a two-year-old, so... (laughs) Um, those are imperatives. There's only one imperative. you know which one it is? It's not go. It's make. The only non-negotiable is that we must make disciples. There's no option. Now, most of our translations say go, and there's good reason why they say go, because Jesus is assuming we'll do it. That's the reason they say go. But what is, is, is maybe a more unique way to look at what Jesus is saying that makes sense with the original language. Jesus says, as you're going, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. So we often translate it go because He's just assuming we're going to. But the point is, as you go, while you're going, make disciples. We're called to make disciples as we go. So where are we going? Well, we get up in the morning, and we have a cup of coffee, and we get in the car. Then we go and we stop by a local coffee shop, buy another cup of coffee, some of us. We have a conversation right there. It's a place we're going, and we're called to make disciples. And then we drive to work. And we spend eight, nine, ten hours with people from our work, and right there, we're called to make disciples. And then we get back in the car, we go to the gym, and there, we're called to make disciples. And listen, then we come home, and we're with our kids, and there, we're called to make disciples. The point is, that for the Christian, the coming and going has been transformed radically because now it's been infused with purpose. What feels purposeless is the precise environment 
in which Christ has sent you to make disciples. The coming and going is no longer about just coming and going. It's about making disciples as you go. The grocery store, the gym, the office, at home, none of these things are lost, purposeless time. Rather, it's time that's been infused with the purpose of making disciples of Jesus Christ. So let me tell you, if you are in Christ, by being in Christ, you have an enormous purpose. Your purpose has gone from maybe pursuing all of the other things that we used to pursue, cars, houses, vacations, to now, wherever I go, whatever I do, it exists for one reason. That's to glorify God by inviting other people into following Jesus. As you go, wherever you go, go there intentionally. Go there with purpose. Go there and make disciples. And I love that he says, make disciples of all nations. Because this also assumes that some of us will sell everything. This assumes that some of us will give up the American dream. Some will give up time with families. Some will give up possible career growth, possible career expansion. Some of us will give up economic flourishing because we believe that our God is a global God with a global mission. And I want everyone in the room to consider if maybe that's supposed to be you. To consider if God's Spirit is summoning and calling you to do that. But let me tell you the other side of the coin. Here in South Florida, all you have to do is leave your house and there are the nations. There's so many people groups here in South Florida. So many languages, so many cultures. And you, you, the church in South Florida, live here. How great is that? And you can live here and be here and intentionally go here to make disciples of all nations here, right here, right now, in South Florida. I don't want to get too political. And I know that many of us here love America. But let's just be clear that our God is a global God with a global mission. Let's just be clear that we not only want God to bless America, we want God to bless Iran. We want God to bless Syria. We want God to bless Guatemala. How? By allowing the gospel of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed. The blessing that we have here in America has nothing to do with what's in our wallet. The blessing that we have is that we can freely communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the beauty of that is that we have that blessing, whether we're under a corrupt government that persecutes us, or whether we have all the freedom in the world. Because what defines me is not my Americanness, it's Christ. And someday, America will be no more. Where's Persia? Where's Greece? Where's Rome? They're gone. But Christ is still king. And His kingdom will be forever. And you and I are first and foremost citizens of that kingdom. Sent to the nations of this world, be they in our backyard or across the globe, and we've been sent with the task of making disciples. So let's get really practical. What does make disciples even mean? Generally, it means inviting people into a relationship with Jesus where they follow Him to become more like Him. This relationship initiates by repenting and believing in the good news of the gospel. 
And Paul makes it very clear so that people would believe in the gospel, so that people would become disciples of Jesus Christ, they must hear the gospel communicated to them. Paul says, but how will they hear if there isn't one to preach? And how will they believe if they haven't heard? Making disciples is all about, yes, opening our mouth and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But let me challenge a little bit the way we think about these things. When we talk about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we talk about sharing the good news, we often assume that the gospel is for those who don't know Jesus. I think you guys have recently done a series about this. We assume that the gospel is for those who are going to hell, those of us who are going to heaven. We already believed in the gospel. That was great. It was good. We left it back here, and now we get to go live like Christians. But Christians continue to need to evangelize themselves. As a matter of fact, this is precisely what Paul does. All of his letters are written to churches. And what does he talk about more than anything? The gospel. Paul spends the majority of his time in his letters proclaiming the gospel to Christians. And I'm convinced that part of the reason why it's so hard for us to share the gospel with other people is because many of us are not all that familiar with the gospel ourselves. What Jesus accomplished on the cross, for most of us, is only good news for a future version of ourselves. For most of us, the gospel is only good news because I'm no longer going to hell and now I'm going to heaven, but we have no idea how this message is relevant for me today. And so when we present the gospel, that's what we say. Well, would you like to go to heaven? I know it doesn't do much for your marriage now. I know it doesn't do much for your wayward children. I know it doesn't really do much for the suffering you're facing, but at least you'll go to heaven. And that's how we present the gospel. The truth of the matter is that the cross and resurrection continues to be the hope for the Christian as well. I can only walk in holiness depending on the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is His death and resurrection that frees me to obey Him. I can only put to death my sin because His death and resurrection freed me from the slavery from sin. I can face whatever suffering in this world because Jesus suffered on the cross to someday rid all the world of suffering. I can have a healthy marriage because I have been revealed in the gospel what it means to love correctly. I can teach and train and raise up my children because my hope isn't placed in my teaching and training. My hope is placed in what Christ accomplished on the cross. And as I do these things, I get abundant life. It's better to walk in holiness. It's better to put to death sin. It's better to know how to live in the midst of suffering. And all of those things depend on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you and I as Christians continue to learn and trust in the gospel more and more, it becomes much easier to share the gospel with others, and by so doing, making disciples of Jesus. As we trust in the gospel more and more, you and I naturally share with others the fountain of the hope that we have. Evangelism is all about that. It's about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. Evangelism is not about getting, to, getting people to behave like Christians. Evangelism is not about getting people to attend your church. Evangelism is about Jesus, what He did what He's doing, and what He'll do. The good news of Jesus is that you couldn't save yourself and that He saved you, and that salvation is very relevant today, not just in the future. So how how do we share this gospel with the goal of making disciples? I want to look at one other verse that I think will help us understand that. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Paul says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Paul says first, 
walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Paul's assuming we're going to spend time with people that don't share our worldview. Paul's assuming we'll have friends that don't believe the same things that we do. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outsiders, who do not yet know, have yet to trust in the gospel message. Paul, this this concept of wisdom is really important in Paul's letter to the Colossians. This idea of knowledge and, 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 and wisdom and understanding are all very important. And in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, all of the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are found in Christ. Walking in wisdom towards outsiders isn't a certain kind of morality. It's Christ. It's walking in Christ. It's being like Him. It's loving them like Him. It's sacrificing for them like Him. It's being merciful towards them like Him. Walking in wisdom towards outsiders is walking in Christ. That Christ and His message constrains and dominates every action and every word. And then he says, let your speech be gracious, filled with grace, and seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It goes from our actions to our speech. And I don't necessarily think that when Paul says, let your speech be gracious, he's just saying, you should be witty, charming. It's probably a part of it. But anytime Paul talks about grace... It's going to mean something much more profound than quick wit. Let your speech be filled with grace. This means that we don't speak the truth of the gospel out of self-righteousness. God's grace is that I couldn't save myself and God out of mercy for me. When we've understood the gospel, it should create in us great humility, great meekness. When we speak the message of the gospel to someone who's yet to believe it, we must do so with humility, with the humility that recognizes that we too at one point didn't believe in this message. We too at one point were broken and dead in our sin and we aren't any better than them. The difference between us and them isn't our morality, the difference is Christ. Christ made us alive in the midst of our deadness. And that's what the gospel message offers. And I'm personally tired, I believe we all should be, of hearing Christians talk to the unbelieving world as if they did something wrong and we did something right. As if we are somehow better than them because of some innate value that we have because we call ourselves Christians. The only reason that any of us are here today is because God had mercy on our souls. And instead of allowing His perfect justice to consume us, He allowed Christ to be consumed by His justice in our place. So assuming we evangelize, we speak words graciously. We speak words lovingly. We speak words mercifully, knowing that we were the object of God's grace and mercy Not because we are good or lovable, but because God is good and loving. And he says, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Here's the issue that I have with pre-canned gospel presentations. They don't take the other person very seriously. Every time we share the gospel, we're not sharing the gospel into a vacuum. These are real people with real suffering, with real hurt, with real frustrations, with real anger, with real sin, and with real sin committed against them. And we believe that what Jesus accomplished on the cross of Jesus Christ is the good news in the midst of those situations. And yet when we present Christ to our neighbors and family members and co-workers, we sound bored out of our mind. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that God is raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Would you like to be saved? (laughs) Now, don't get me wrong. 
Did we say the gospel? Yeah. Believing in the gospel, though, being saved is not just about getting that person to pray with you. Being saved is not just about that person getting to heaven or getting out of hell. Believing the gospel, being saved, is about adopting an entirely new paradigm for your life where Jesus is king. And we believe that repenting and trusting in Jesus as their Savior and King radically changes everything. But we don't preach the gospel that way. Paul says that we may know how to answer each person. The idea is we don't answer each person the same way. Paul primarily has objections to the gospel in mind, and I think this broadly applies to all of our evangelism. Each individual person that we interact with needs to hear why the gospel of Jesus is good news for them. And it isn't just good news because they can escape hell and go to heaven. It's good news because it reorders their marriage entirely. It's good news because it empowers them to let go of their vices. It's good news because it fills them with hope in the midst of suffering. It's good news because it redefines the purpose of their life entirely. It's good news because it gives them life and life abundantly. But I'm afraid most of us are not familiar enough with the gospel to actually share it that way. I'm afraid that we ourselves have not been deconstructed and reconstructed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we breathe every day is not necessarily gospel truths. What we live every day is not necessarily gospel truths. We live some sort of mishmash of American self-empowerment and individualism that we've added Christ to the package. You are weak. We are weaker and more broken than we could ever imagine. And we are more loved and accepted than we could ever conceive. The task that we've been given is to make disciples, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you may be here saying, well, Justin, when we put it like that, I'm not sure that I am ready to make disciples. I'm not sure I'm ready to share the gospel. And here's the beauty of it. We need to be reminded of the gospel to share the gospel. You and I are feeble, fickle, weak, and broken. And the life that we used to live has been crucified with Christ, and the life that we now live, it's not us who lives, and it's Christ who lives in us. And so sometimes we need to bring our fear of making disciples to the same cross of Jesus Christ and nail it once again to the cross. We need to bring our worry and anxiety of being hated and mocked to the cross of Jesus Christ, recognizing that He was hated and mocked for us. We bring our sense of loneliness and gospel proclamation to the cross, recognizing that Jesus was left entirely alone at the cross so that we might be included into God's family. And as we come to be broken by the same gospel over and over again, as we are rebuilt in Christ, we gain authority. We gain confidence in Christ's authority. We trust that His presence is with us, and we open our mouths. And as we go, wherever we go, we share the hope of a Savior Emmanuel, God with us. We share the hope of a king who is much better at running this world and our lives than we are. We share the hope of a sacrifice who gave himself in our place, who died so that we might live. Let me be a little bit direct for a moment. The American church has got to get out of its walls. We're stuck in here. We come in here Sundays and we sing about this Jesus and we talk about this Jesus and we enjoy this Jesus and then we leave in Monday morning, nothing's different. And then we want our our friend to know about Jesus, but since we don't really necessarily know the gospel enough, we have to bring them to church so that the pastor will tell them. Jesus' authority is with you too. Jesus' spirit is with you too. 
And so instead of us learning how to share the gospel with our neighbors and our friends, we rely on church programs to do that for us. And we cross our fingers and really hope that somebody might come to Jesus at our next big event. And if we were to grasp the power of what if everyone went, do you know what South Florida would look like? If we would embrace the beauty of as you go, make disciples of all nations, things would look quite different. What if everyone went? I think the point is we already are. We're already going every day. But Christian, what will you do as you go? We get to be like the woman at the well and her everyday ordinary stuff, going and getting water as a collision with Jesus. Drops her water where it is, runs back and says, I have to tell you about this man. We get to be like the blind man. In the middle of his everyday things, I don't know who the guy was, all I know is that I used to be blind, but now I see. We could be like the crazy guy who sold all of his possessions because he found a treasure that was far more valuable. And we get to teach people by proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus Christ that their cars aren't worth it, their careers aren't worth it, their houses aren't worth it, Their vices aren't worth it. Their anger isn't worth it. Their control isn't worth it. Their need for respect and power isn't worth it. That Christ is worth far more if they only will repent and trust in Him. They will enjoy life evermore precisely as Christ has designed it to be. Let's pray. God, thanks for your grace towards us. Thanks for your mercy. God, and thanks that you use broken, feeble, weak people like me. Thank you, Lord, that you are king. that all the authority is yours. And may we be ever faithful. May we be true to the commission and the purpose that you've given us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.